All right, so um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, case study that you see in front of you. And I wanted to just kind of give you a little bit of background on biomagnification and bioaccumulation um, as it pertains to this. Now, I know we just got finished talking about biomagnification, bioaccumulation in class, and I'm kind of setting you off on doing this case study. So this right here is going to represent the one of the major summatives that we're actually going to have for Unit 8. So right here is um, kind of a little bit of a diagram of um, the differences that we can find in terms of mercury levels in fish. Um, on the left hand side is fish that you can catch and clean and you know cut up and cook. All right, and then on the right hand side is fish that you can buy in any one of our local grocery stores. So, and what I want you to notice down here is these fish that usually are the ones that are probably the best to throw on the grill. Um, you know, your tuna, your swordfish steaks, your shark steaks, those are the ones that tend to be higher in, uh, in mercury. Um, and uh, so we definitely want to try to focus when we're regarding mercury content in fish, we want to focus on the ones up here, Atlantic salmon, your flounders, okay, you get your, uh, your shellfish. And notice that the canned tuna, all right, especially the light tuna, um, tends to be lower in mercury than getting a tuna steak or getting your canned white tuna. All right, so you know, as we talked about before, where does most mercury come from? Most mercury is going to come from coal-burning power plants. Um, that coal, you know, contains mercury naturally, and when it gets burned, the mercury goes up the smokestacks and it gets released into the atmosphere. Okay, and then after it gets released in the atmosphere, you've got mercury as particulate matter. Um, it gets it settles and deposits into land and water. Eventually, bacteria wind up converting it to this uh, methyl mercury, which is the, uh, the the form of mercury that is actually toxic. So again, that toxic mercury then gets into the food web. All right, so uh, phytoplankton, algae, it kind of builds up in them. So you have a small concentration of, of mercury in those algae, and those algae wind up getting eaten by snails or zooplankton or even you know plant-eating fish. Um, and because those snails, plant-eating fish, and zooplankton actually eat a little bit more of those phytoplankton, their mercury levels wind up building up. And then small fish and largemouth bass, they wind up eating a lot of the you know plant-eating fish or the zooplankton and the snails. So they actually wind up building up even more of a concentration in that methylmercury inside their tissues. So here is the the overall kind of chain of events. So you've got you know humans burning coal. All right, we get mercury in terms of particulate matter into the atmosphere. That particulate matter winds up getting deposited onto land and into water. Bacteria help to convert that into methylmercury. And then the methylmercury builds its way up the food chain um, as it goes through phytoplankton and into some of those first order consumers, second order consumers, and even third order consumers. So what you're gonna see in, um, in the case study is you're actually gonna wind up seeing a three pronged kind of experimentation to look at mercury levels in fish and in soil and in water. So here were their methods, okay, for the fish. They looked at collecting 291 fish uh, from streams all over the country. Um, they were really focusing in on largemouth bass. And I think the reason they were focusing in on largemouth bass is because they were actually second and third level consumers. So they wanted to see exactly what the concentrations of mercury were in their tissues because largemouth bass are eating um, a consumer that is below them, which in turn is eating um, perhaps another consumer that's below them, which in turn is eating uh, algae at the producer level. So what they did was they caught fish by a number of different methods um, and then they filleted them and then they looked at the mercury content in each one of those fillets. When they looked at uh, sediment, all right, they basically took sediment samples um, and they were looking to uh, measure mercury levels in the sediment. So really when you think about it, the sediment and the water piece are probably you know the, the part of that first step in the chain of events with regard to methylmercury production. Um, so we have mercury that is released into the atmosphere through smokestacks, and then it's as particulate matter, and that particulate matter settles down into the soil and into the water. So they were looking at it in terms of a, of a magnification and accumulation in the fish, but then they were also looking at the, the, the first couple of, of steps there with sediment and water. So what they actually wound up finding was they wound up finding um, these were the levels um, of, of, of micrograms per gram uh, of mercury of methylmercury content. 
okay? Um, and these are the commonly uh, sampled fish species. Um, the error bars represent about a standard deviation away from the mean there. And what we're seeing is that the red line right there is actually the EPA criteria um, for you know, human health. So that's like the accepted concentration for humans um, for our for ingesting mercury. So if we're eating largemouth bass or spotted bass, according to this study, we're actually exceeding um, the mercury levels that we should have. Um, this next line actually shows uh, the concern level for fish eating mammals. Okay, so we can actually see that that level down there, I mean, you're, you're seeing that uh, pretty much all of these different types of trout, the different types of bass, they actually have mercury content levels that are higher than the concern levels um, that are set for, uh, for fish eating mammals. So every single fish that they tested in this study um, was found to contain mercury and um, some of the bass species, which tend to be the ones that fishermen actually go to target and then um, uh, you know, try to catch and clean and eat. Um, those are the ones that actually wind up having the higher levels of mercury in them. So, you know, the mercury concentrations in fish um, are in fact several orders higher, they found, than the actual mercury concentrations that were in the stream water. Okay, so what they found was it wasn't this concept of them absorbing mercury from the water that they were swimming in, it was this accumulation of mercury um, throughout the food chain. So or, organisms down on the food chain eat, eat something that has mercury in it, and then that mercury winds up going into the tissues of that organism, and then the consumer up above it actually winds up eating a number of these organisms, so their mercury levels wind up going up, and it's up and up and up and up and up, okay? So basically what happens is, is it's like you think about uh, this bioaccumulation, so it's the, this buildup of substances like pesticides or heavy metals like mercury inside of an organism's tissues. And bioaccumulation, it happens when an organism actually brings in more of that substance um, than it can actually excrete. So you see this diagram down here on the bottom where it talks about mercury coming in, okay, and then it accumulates in there and it accumulates faster than it's actually able to, to get rid of it. Okay, so we see this mercury level going in, okay, and it just continues to kind of grow inside of that, uh, inside of that organism. So what we're going to see here is we're going to look at where, you know, the highest concentrations of mercury were found in the United States based on this study. Um, so we're actually seeing uh, the mercury levels here in, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, which is going to be the basis of what you're looking at in your case study. Okay, so they're looking at the, the, the position of the uh, on the food web or trophic position um, and the relationship between mercury levels based on level in the food chain. Okay, so what they did was they collected a bunch of fish, crustaceans, you know, zooplankton, all these different organisms, and they were measuring their methylmercury levels. Okay, so we could probably put together a food web here knowing that our salmon and our smallmouth bass. Um, are going to be higher up on the food web, um, and then some of these other ones are going to be lower down on the food web. So we're act they're actually taking a look at um, how do the mercury content, mercury levels actually change based on an organism's position in the food chain. So here's what they found. Okay, they actually found that in fish, um, you know, you had that pike minnow, um, you had the smallmouth bass, um, had very very high concentrations of mercury, the cutthroat trout as well. Um, so you can actually see this almost represents what the food web might look like. You know, you could actually put a food web together here. You actually see that, you know, phytoplankton is down at the bottom, okay? And then you see zooplankton right there. So you have that bulk zooplankton which eats phytoplankton. Its methylmercury content is 4 plus or minus 0 0.4, okay? Then you kind of move further up, all right? That caddisfly larvae, 6 plus or minus 0 0.06. Okay, so that would probably, those two things right there would probably be your first order consumers. Then you have your crayfish, all right, your mycids, okay, so you see those in there and you start to see that the um, levels of mercury are increasing as we go up in levels of the, the food chain. So here is actually our, you know, food web for this. So you can see how the smallmouth bass and the pike minnow kind of being up at the top of the food web, they're the ones that actually wind up bringing in a whole bunch of mercury from all of the things underneath it that they eat. 
and they bring it in at a greater rate than they are actually able to excrete it. So that right here is, 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 is visualized with your mercury content over here on the left hand side. So we see a smaller um, ellipse over here that represents concentrations of mercury in these organisms down here at the bottom of your food web. Those organisms kind of pass that mercury along to the things up top. And because these guys are actually eating high, high quantities of these guys down here, they're actually bringing in a lot more mercury than they're able to secrete. And then that actually kind of increases exponentially as we go even further up in the food web. So that right there was a, an example of bioaccumulation. The concept of biomagnification is an increase in concentration of a pollutant from one link in a food chain to another. So bioaccumulation is where an organism takes in more of a, I guess we could call it a pathogen, than it can excrete. Okay, so the, 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 the nature by which they take something in, all right, it builds up inside of their tissues quicker than they can actually get rid of it. Biomagnification deals really with um, the movement of a toxin or a pollutant through a food chain, okay? So if a substance can in fact biomagnify, then the organisms that are up at the top of the food chain are actually gonna wind up having higher concentrations than those down the, low, the lower portion of the food chain, which is what we were seeing in that last food web from Lake Washington. So, you know, it's this kind of cumulative effect. So if we're looking over here, we see these, you know, producers or first order consumers, they're smaller. So these fish right here eating these guys, they're gonna eat a whole bunch of these guys. So they're gonna build up their mercury in their tissues faster than they can excrete it. So every single step here is a step of bioaccumulation, but the magnification is how it continues to grow throughout all of these levels of the food chain. So again, Think about this, the fish that you can catch and eat or the fish that you buy um, in terms of watching out for your mercury content. Um, you know, you certainly want to kind of err on the side of eating salmon and shellfish and maybe limit your intake of tuna and halibut, swordfish, shark steaks, even though they taste really, really good. <laughs> So here are the credits for the image and all that good stuff. I'm actually going to uh, gonna stop the video here and I'm going to um, I'm gonna pick up next actually looking at your case study. So I'll be back with you in just one sec. Okay, I'm back. So here is your case study that you're gonna be looking at. Um, you can find this case study on Schoology. So really what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wind up just kind of going through and letting you know what exactly it is I'd like for you to do here. So obviously we're gonna read through the case study. It's looking at mercury bioaccumulation, biomagnification. There's a little bit of a kind of a preamble and introduction into how everything is, is going. And this really talks about you know a, a woman and her friend talking and they're at a restaurant and the woman is gonna order some tuna and she tells her friend that she's pregnant and her friend is like, hey, I'm not sure you wanna order tuna because of you know mercury. Um, so, so that's this, this first part. And then the second part is, you know, kind of some information about um, risks for pregnant women and their intake of, of mercury. All right. So continue to read through this um, advice from 2004 the, from the EPA and the FDA for levels of mercury uh, for pregnant women. Um, after reading through that, I want you to go ahead and answer these four questions down at the bottom of page two. And then we're going to go ahead and continue on. And really this whole part, part three, how does mercury get into fish, is kind of an extension upon what we just talked about in this video. So what you're going to wind up doing is you're going to read through um, some, of the, uh, some of the studies um, that are presented here in your case study. Okay, so we can see that there are, you know, certain levels of mercury that we can find um, in waterways. All right, so this is the wet deposition. Um, of, of mercury throughout different portions of the US. So after you get to uh, you know the top of page four, this right here is kind of the details of what I went over in the in in the you know a little while ago when I was going through the, the presentation, talking about the methods at which the USGS was actually testing mercury levels. So they tested it in fish, they tested it in the soil, they tested it in the water. So here's the graph that I showed you with regard to the mercury concentration levels that they found in these uh, multiple different types of, um, of fish that they studied. 
And then you get down here and you have this overall um, kind of table where you're looking at the mean and median and standard deviations of the different um, things that they tested, okay? So we actually see um, minimum, maximum values from fish tissue, sediment samples, water samples that were, at, that were analyzed for methylmercury, okay? So I want you to take a look at all that data and then I want you to go ahead and answer questions one through seven here um, on the, uh, the bottom of page five. Then after you get into that, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a look at how mercury is actually going through aquatic food chain. So I showed you in that presentation um, from Lake Washington, the food web and kind of seeing how mercury is actually moving up through that food web. So um, this first part up here, page three, four, five, we're talking about bioaccumulation. Then we get down here to page six. Now we're actually looking at biomagnification throughout these food webs. All right, so this right here is something that we actually saw in the presentation. So you can actually see how um, mercury levels are actually magnifying as they work their way up. And then finally, I want you to do questions one and two here, drawing the food web. Okay, you can actually go back in the video and maybe I'll make that presentation that I was looking at um, available to you all on Schoology. Um, but you're going to draw a food web for Lake Washington using the species that you see there um, and uh, showing how mercury is actually moving up through the food chain. Okay, and then you're going to label the species there um, as either having high concentrations, medium concentrations, or low concentrations. Um, and then you're going to answer this question, you know, why do they, which, which ones have the highest levels of mercury, which ones have the lowest, why is that? And then finally, wrapping it up, there's this final activity. Okay, and actually what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you guys to do number two, which is finding two other, two other examples of compounds that biomagnify. So this whole thing has been about mercury. So I'd actually like to do for you to do a little bit of extra research to where you can actually find a couple of other compounds that biomagnify and explain how each one um, enters the, uh, the biosphere and then what impacts it has on living organisms in general and specifically humans, okay? So um, that's how I'd like for you to wrap up this case study. Again, um, I'm gonna assign it today in class, which is uh, Friday, May 7th. Um, and uh, I'm looking to have this done by next Friday, May 14th, okay? But I'll talk to you again about it in class today. So um, I, uh, if you have any questions, please just let me know. And I hope that was uh, helpful.